Hi everybody, JB back again uh, with, with an entirely different type of uh, a video this time. Instead of my usual local history, I'm going to do a, a three video biography, uh, so to speak, of, uh, of my mother, our mother, <laughs> my siblings, <laughs> Fidela Gilbert Hogan. We're, I'm calling it Mother, Musician, and Poet. And the first two videos will be about her life and progress as a musician and poet. And the last one will be about her poetry. Now I'll read a few poems in that one. Anyway, so this is part one from the beginning. And this opening slide here shows a cover of the Flashback Journal, Washington County Historical Society from 2011, as a picture of my mother. By the way, I need to say it right now, <laughs> since the early 70s, I called her Granny or Gran. <laughs> so it would be hard for me not to call her anything but that. <laughs> this, this is a picture of Gran holding a banjo. And in that issue, my sister Martha Hogan Estes had uh, taken some of her uh, memoirs or her journals and uh, excerpted them and, and published in the flashback. So that's what that's about. So let's start with this and see how it goes. So she was born on March 12, 1918 at Osage Mills, which is in Benton County. And this is a picture of her parents, Joseph and Sophia Scott Gilbert. This picture is from around 1901 when they were married. They had uh, seven kids and they lost another, as was so common in those days. Uh, Gran was the uh, fifth, <laughs> Fidella was the fifth of, of the seven children. Uh, dear, dearer kids were Carl, Thelma, Buck, and Alma, who I'll talk about uh, frequently. Yeah, she was a tomboy and they call her Billy or Bill. So when I talk about Aunt Bill, <laughs> it's, actually, it's really my aunt. Uh, and then Gran came along. Uh, and then in 1918, and then her sister Helen and brother Leslie were born after that. So, uh, so here's a picture of, of uh, Aunt Thelma and Fidel. Around 1920, Gran was a tiny person. She was slightly under five feet tall, <laughs> barely weighed 100 pounds. When she weighed 108 pounds, she thought of herself as fat. <laughs> she would go on a diet. Anyway. She was a really small person, so we think she's probably two years old here. Uh, Aunt Thelma tragically died in 1930 at uh, 25 years of age. Uh, she was the mother of our cousin Walter Allen, who will uh, at least be mentioned in the, in the last video. I, at the very last video, I have a little bit of a sound clip of, of uh, my mother, our mother, uh, talking and playing a little bit of banjo, about two minutes, if I can have that as a few tube won't block it somehow. Anyway, so there's Aunt Thelma and Granny. And Thelma, uh, uh, granddad, who is known as Dad Gilbert, by the way, that's Dad Gilbert and Grandma and Thelma. They're all buried out of Zion, as is Granny. And then here's a real cute little picture of, of her. Here's uh, Fidel in the very back left there, a cute little picture. And there's Aunt Helena. That's another thing I'll say. All, all of her siblings are my aunts and uncles, so it's hard for me not to call them <laughs> aunt and uncle. And we don't know who the other little kids are. They're little friends, I think. But this is about 1923, we're guessing. And Helen was born in 21 and Granny in 18. So we're kind of guessing that's a, about when this picture was taken. Oh, by the way, uh, I, I don't think I mentioned yet. Dad Gilbert's nickname, a couple of guys have nicknames for her. I want to mention as I go along. And Dad Gilbert's nickname for her, we believe that we recall right, it was Tudor, <laughs> which is a cute little nickname. Okay. So this is one I always had to put in here. I, at one point, they, when she was small, they lived uh, real close to the War Eagle Mill. This is a picture from their website. And uh, if you cross that bridge and just on the other side of the road, there's a Y there. If you go left, that's the Hobbs State Park and the Van Winkle Hollow. And if you go straight, it goes on the ways and winds back up and they live back up in there. And Grand used to tell me stories when she was a little girl, she would run down to the store, not the mill. There's a little store that used to be just beyond the mill. And I always talk about the mill because her great uncle, I guess my great great uncle, uh, James K.P. Stringfield, married Emily Van Winkle, uh, Peter Van Winkle's daughter. And for a while, J.K.P. was the owner operator of the War Eagle Mill. So I'm always threatening to go out there and demand <laughs> free goods from him because my uncle used to own it. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then here's a picture from Healing Springs, which is out on the way to the uh, X and A to the airport. The little, these little buildings are all there. I, we included this one because Dad Gilbert at one time uh, had a, a blacksmith shop there. They, 
I think he, he moved around a lot. They did, the family, uh, you know, for, you'd open blacksmith shop here and there. I think a lot of times it's to follow the, the, the crops and, and so forth, but always to try to, to better the family. Anyway, so that's out at Healing Springs. There, by the way, just to the right of this picture, if you're looking, looking, I am, uh, was the railroad tracks. Okay, so there's Zion School, and that's still there. I took this picture, you know, not long ago. Uh, you might have seen East of Zion, we, the band, our family band. We took our picture on the steps of there, too, for our card. Anyway, so Graham's age put her where she couldn't start first grade at the right time, so she uh, started in 1925, but she had already learned how to read. She's a very sharp, smart person, and as a, even as a little kid. And so they started her in the second grade in, in uh, 1925. And as I mentioned, uh, just uh, five years after that, her, her sister Thelma passed away. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so here's a picture of, of the class. We think it's the year before she graduated in 31. And uh, she, by the way, she did graduate as top of her class. So in Little Zion School, she was the valedictorian <laughs> of her eighth grade class. That's as far as they went. And this is this is Fidel right here, and they're looking a little a little angry, a little glum. <laughs> and this is Aunt Helen looking as cute as she could be, just to just to Grand's left, our right. And this is Mildred Ragsdale Bailey, who was a lifelong friend and a terrific, <laughs> interesting person, and great friends all all their lives. And that's the three of them right there. Very cute picture. Okay, so next. Okay, so now we get into the music portion of it. So when Gran was 12, her older brother, Buck Clarence, Buck Gilbert, he was a cool guy, played the mandolin, but he had a banjo and he got him a new one and he gave Granny his, uh, his old one and she learned to play and she learned to play really well. Anyway, this is a great picture from, we believe this is 34, the same year she's going to get married at 16 years old. Uh, with the family. This is, if you've seen it, this is a cover of Singing in Zion that was done by Professor Bob Cochran at the U of A, University of Arkansas. So let me go through real quick. This is cousin Ernest Scott right here. This is Aunt Bill, Aunt Alma. Uh, this is Ruth Scott, who will be married Pug Gare later. This is Granny Goose right there. And this is Helen hiding behind the neck of uh, my mom's banjo. <laughs> And this is unbelievable. I couldn't believe we found this picture. Mark, by the way, 95% of the images in this in this whole PowerPoint that I'm presenting were found by Martha in her collection. Unbelievable. Anyway, this is this is all the same people in the 70s. Is that cool or what? Here's Aunt Bill standing here. There's Ruth Scott Gare right there. And there's Granny playing a, a guitar in this case. There's Aunt Helen on banjo, a lady we don't know. And there's Ernest Scott on banjo. That is an amazing thing that you could have a picture of those same people you know, that far apart and also playing music still. And I, I should probably mention at this point that uh, they played all around the community, played the, what they call play parties in the old days. And they were almost on the radio in Springdale, but Dad Gilbert nixed the idea. And we've always wondered, well, back in the day when they were doing this, you know, maybe they would have become another uh, a famous family, the Carter family or something, you know, their lives, everything could have been totally different if they'd have played on the radio, but it didn't happen. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this real fast. The, in 1933, a real handsome, exciting, kind of rugged uh, migrant worker named Bill Hogan <laughs> uh, showed up from Missouri down here and sparked a, a, a romantic relationship with, with uh, and my mom, and uh, and he went away for the year, and she wasn't sure he'd come back, but he did. He came back the next year, and they were married in 1934. Uh, the person who signed the uh, marriage license was Merle Cruz, the county clerk. You've heard me talk about him before. He's the guy whose license plate was on the uh, death car of Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, uh, they moved, lived most of the time up in Missouri because that's where his family is from, and uh, this is, in, of course, in the middle of the Great Depression. And this picture here that I've got here is one I always love to show people. This, well, if this doesn't show you what the Depression was like and what it, what the lives were like, that's uh, our mom holding Martha, who's just a little baby, and that's uh, our father Bill Hogan holding little Bill Hogan, <laughs> uh, my oldest brother there, and uh, in about 1938, and it was kind of a rough life. But anyway, to, to sum it up real fast. That the relationship lasted around 10 years, 
and it was real rocky about halfway through and eventually it just it broke apart and i'll make a, a statement in a second about that but i don't want to get too far into that uh anyway there's a picture of uh, our father around 1940 he lost his arm uh, in a car accident he had his left arm out the window and somebody sideswiped him and took his arm off you can imagine how horrible that was anyway and here's a picture of what the family calls the pine tree place. It's up in Nevada, Missouri. And if you can see in the doorway, you can't quite see her, but that's our mother standing in the doorway. And this is Bill and Jill, and I think Martha's in there somewhere in the little doggy. Uh, this kind of, to me, this looks like one of the nicest places they lived at. <laughs> they, at one point, they lived in a modified chicken house. You can imagine they were very, they were very, <laughs> very poor. It was, it was not a good time that way economically. And so by this is where around 43, I believe, and this is, we refer to this as putting on a happy face because they were pretty much breaking apart at this stage. And what I want to uh, say here is that I'll just make this statement about our dad, that he was the uh, son and grandson of a uh, railroad Irish. Uh, in his younger days, he was a hard drinking barroom brawler of near legendary proportions. In fact, I would say they are legendary proportions. He was, he was a rough, tough character. Anyway, so finally, after that time, the, their marriage was over, and Granny comes back to Arkansas, and she, this is out in Zion, and this is known as the coal mine place. And now it was not, it was not, this is a remodeled version from just a few years ago. This front part was not there. It's a little bitty house. I was born in that house. Granny's there with four kids, and Helen's there with four kids, her youngest being Larry, my best pal cousin, who would buy, he's about not quite two years older than me. They're all in that house, plus Dad Gilbert. Eleven people are living in this house, while Bob, Uncle Bob, and Helen's husband, Bob Fulce, is away in World War II in the Navy. And here's a picture of Uncle Bob. And, of course, when he came back from the World War II, then we had to move out. And... Uh, and so that leads to, to, the, to the next phase here, which is eventually we moved into Fayetteville. We lived in Cave Springs, Mayfield, and Goshen. Uh, and we left Goshen in 1949. If you want some little reference point, I was four years old when we moved into Fayetteville. And from this stage on, our mom had to become very resourceful. She did many jobs, many changes, uh, did all kinds of work, including uh, domestic work, anything to survive. And this is a picture from, we think uh, it's either 49 or 50, I think probably 50, 1950. This is Dad Gilbert, he's getting older here and he's getting sick as he towards the end of his life. That's Martha on the steps there. You see that big sign there? That's for the ice man, tell him how much ice to deliver. <laughs> Some of you probably remember that. So anyway, that's down on uh, North Glendale. It's actually Greg and always has been, but at that time it was called uh, North Glendale and it was outside the city limits. Railroad track right behind the house. Luckily there was an embankment, but it was really close to in our backyard. Uh, and so Grand, so I said she worked for a bunch of different, different things, including uh, doing domestic work for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Homer Pearson. Uh, Mr. Pearson was a former city attorney. Super nice people, treated us really well. And, and, but eventually, uh, our mom started working in the restaurants, and that's what she started doing here in Fayetteville. And this is a picture. You may have seen this before somewhere. I think I've used it somewhere else. This is on college. The Ozark Theater is just over here to the right, Caddy Corner. This is the old Gulf Cafe, if you all remember. And I talked about it in one of my history things. But this is her uh, outside the Gulf Cafe. And then this is a picture of her. I think you may have seen this one somewhere, too. I can't remember where I did this. But anyway, she's walking. Maybe on, on Facebook, I put them up. Anyway, this is a picture coming home from working at the garment factory up there, almost at the corner of Lafayette and West Avenue in Fayetteville. And she's almost to Dixon Street here. So she did all kinds of work. Eventually, she kind of zeroed in and, and worked most of the time at Jug Wheeler's, which I'm going to show in a second. But for a while, she had her own restaurant. She had a little bit of a little bit of entrepreneur about her. And nothing ever got really big, but they, they, they had always wanted to do their own little businesses and stuff. So anyway, so this picture is an older one that Tony uh, Wapo used in his Once Upon Dixon. This is, uh, I think, from 1947. I do believe there are people in that picture that we actually work with. And I want to make the point, uh, our mom was the uh, night, eventually the night manager at, at Jug Wheelers. And, uh, 
every single member of our family worked at Juggs, every one of us, including two of our, of our spouses or significant others. So Juggs was a really important part of our lives. So that's what she was doing there, uh, doing uh, restaurant work the rest of the time we were in Fayetteville because as the, as the 50s wound down, moving towards 60, uh, Bill left home, joined the service. Martha moved, got married, moved away. It was just me and Joe. And people, the uh, University of Arkansas started discovering folklore people, thanks to Vance Randolph and Mary Parler here, shown in this picture. And in 5960, uh, at the instigation of one of these, of Jim Bob Wheeler, Jug Wheeler's son, who you know, a lot of you may remember him, super great guy. He always called uh, our mother, Mother Hogan. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, Mary Parler uh, recorded my mom and, and Helen, and even Aunt Bill was back one time, recorded the family. The University of Arkansas has those recordings in the Parler collection. And also at this time, with the help and, and, uh, and encouragement of Aunt Bill, uh, she began to uh, uh, write and become a poet. As I got here, and a poet emerges. And this, I just had to discover. She wouldn't publish quite yet, but to my recollection anyway, but this, this is the kind of small journals. She had many, many poems in these smaller journals like the Orphic Lute. It's a, it's a you know, time-honored tradition of poets is to get published where you may. Okay, so finally, Joe went into the service. And that left just me and, and Gran. And the doctor, so her health was not very good. And the doctor suggested that we move to California in a dry area. And Aunt Bill and her husband, Alex Allen, and uh, his brother, Burl Allen, who had been married to Aunt Thelma, who passed away, one of those double, you know, two brothers married two sisters. Well, they had moved to this little town, Calipatria, California, in the Imperial Valley. And so in early 61, I mean, March of 61, Gran went on out there for her health. And at the end of that school year, I joined her. And the reason I show this picture, this picture is actually from 1938 in Calipatria, Calipat, we call it. This is kind of the four corners. This is going north to there and back this way as he is to the west. The reason I show this picture, this building is gone now, but most of the time in Calipat that we lived there, we lived in this apartment right here. These two windows was our apartment. That was the kitchen window and dining room, and that was the living room. So I, I wanted to include that because it's real personal. And, uh, and here's some stuff about Calipat. It had, that, it had the world's, it the world's tallest flagpole because it's 184 feet below sea level and the flagpole is right at sea level. And you can see it call itself <laughs> the lowest down city in the Western Hemisphere, which I always found amusing. It was a, I had a lot of good experiences there and so did Grant. She, be, she began working again in restaurants, but as you'll see in this one, and I we call it California Dreaming, in my junior year, the second semester of my junior year, she actually worked as a librarian at Calipatria High. And you can see, I think, by looking at her face, she's not healed. She's still kind of sickly looking. But people loved her there, which brings my point. She was a really personable person. And people like her. Our joke in the family is our friends always liked her better, better than they liked us. And it's not much of a joke. It's kind of the truth. It's a very personal person. Uh, Anyway, and so she began to, you know, continue to write a lot and get more serious about it. And she took a class at Imperial Valley College, where I would attend one year, as you probably know. And in the fall of 62, you can see she took creative writing. And what a surprise, she got an A. <laughs> so that's, uh, that takes us up. I think that, uh, yeah, that takes us up to the, uh, to the end of uh, the first video. And the second video, I will continue with the life and poetry of Fidel Hogan. And uh, thank you all for being with me and thanks to friends and family. I hope you enjoy this uh, little bio of uh, Fidel Hogan, AKA <laughs> uh, Granny Goose. Uh, talk to you soon, bye-bye.